When you think you're unsinkable, you're already sunk. And that's a mindset problem. We are seeing a turnover of the mighty and unsinkable like we've never seen before. This is our time to grab the niches, to offer alternatives. People are not as loyal as before to a singular brand and the brands cannot hold their spaces. But our mindset needs to change. That's why I'm saying the 20th century thinking is like money is short. There's very few players who have it. We cannot have access to money. Money is a democratized commodity right now. There's more money on the planet that possibly we have value for. You can crowdsource, you can crowdfund. There's tons of ways to get money. And ideas, Google it. The problem is not money or ideas. The problem is the execution that stems from the right mindset. So that's on us. Welcome to the Seven Hats podcast. My name is Yuval Selig, and I've been on the entrepreneurial roller coaster for over 20 years. I've experienced it all throughout my journey, the grind, burnout, failure, and ultimately, success. The turning point for me was realizing that building a successful company is meaningless if you neglect the other significant areas of your life. So today, I'm inviting you to join me on an adventure through those seven areas, what I call the seven hats. Every week, my guests and I will drop valuable insights and pearls of wisdom, helping, motivating, and inspiring you to get your seven hats in order and deliver real impact with meaning. So let's get going. Welcome, Seven Hatters. A year ago, I launched the Seven Hats podcast to assemble a community of like-minded entrepreneurs who crave and favor fulfillment in place of achievement in their lives. And I couldn't be more proud of the community that we've built in just one year. Today's episode is a milestone for the Seven Hats. It's our 50th episode, and I'm so proud to present our next guest on this very special occasion. In this episode, we speak with Dr. Nadia jackson Baiva and dive deep into hats one, three, and four, the soul, the servant, and the entrepreneur, as we reinvent ourselves and learn how to thrive in chaos. Called the reinvention guru in Venture Magazine and the queen of reinvention, Dr. Nadia is an entrepreneur, educator, speaker, and author specializing in reinvention. Nadia is a four-time TEDx speaker an author of four books and a contributor to many others, a professor, international keynote speaker, the go-to person for Coca-Cola, IBM, Cisco, Henkel, and other corporations who look to reinvent their products, processes, and leadership practices. So if you're ready to reinvent your way out of any challenge that you face today or future-proof your business for the many disruptions coming your way, then let's welcome Nadia to the Seven Hats. Nadia, welcome to the Seven Hats. So happy to have the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, listen, I am so excited to speak with you because I feel like, like many of us in America and maybe other first world countries, I don't think that they appreciate the life that they have or are blessed to have. You know, yes, we have our difficulties and of course, tragedies happen on a daily basis, but for some in the world, the chaos and challenges that the collective population face are really insurmountable and really beyond our imagination. I know mine for sure. You know, and you, Nadia, you had a front row seat growing up to chaos, but yet look at you now, you know, someone who's achieved success well beyond, I think, of what could have been imagined for you as a child. We'll get to all of those glorious nuggets on how you got there and what you've learned along the way. But let's start at the beginning of your journey to understand where you came from and what you went through to become the hero of your hero's journey. So Nadia, where were you born and how was your childhood like? It's the question that gives me goosebumps because it brought me back to my childhood. I was born in Kazakhstan in the Soviet Union one of 15 republics of the Soviet Union. If you imagine the U.S. has 50 states, uh, USSR had 15 republics, and they're all very different. And my republic, at the time I was born, 
was a place where everyone who was unwanted by the regime was forcefully moved or put in a prison camp. Almost every gulag and concentration camp of Soviet Union was on the territory of Kazakhstan because we're ninth largest country in the world, but have a tiny, tiny population. So we have a lot of vast land. And then on top of that, all nuclear testing of the Soviet Union happened on the territory of Kazakhstan with extreme, extreme health damage to the local population where the nuclear testing was happening. And to set the context, uh, I had a beautiful childhood, I thought, right? So you grew up, I have lovely, lovely parents. They're both engineers. You grew up, you don't know what you don't have. So my childhood, normal responsibility, not daily, but I would say every third day is to stand in line to get food. You are given food a portion per person. So my mom would bring every kid in line with three to get three portions plus her own instead of one portion. And what were we standing in line for? My responsibility was sour cream. Saturday morning, 5 a.m., you stand for sour cream for four hours. At nine, the store opens and they pour it in your little glass jar and you bring it home. And if you they run out of it, you stood for nothing. So that would be a typical child, but you don't know it's bad, right? No. <laughs> you know it's bad, it's just your life. I started waking up to what was going on when I grew up and realized I don't have a grandfather, one of them. And I started asking questions about the grandfather until I learned that he's the son of the enemy of the state, one of millions of executed for nothing, that he was sent forcefully to an orphanage house at the age of 14, that he married a girl right there in the orphanage house, brought her back to Kazakhstan, served in the army in the Second World War, grew up a journalist, spoke again the regime, tortured in prison, killed himself before I was born. Like this mm. thing slowly builds up only when you approach teenage years. Until then, this is the life you know, and this is the best life you can have. So you make the best of it. Wow. I can relate. Uh, we spoke a little bit prior to this interview. My parents are from Russia mm -hmm. and my dad, and we're Jewish. Mm -hmm. So that, that in addition to being in Russia was difficult back um, in the 60s and 70s. And I remember my dad telling me stories of him being 14 years old and seeing what is going on with the gulags and, and other prison camps and, and whatever they were doing, and especially against the Jews at that time. He knew that he had to escape. He couldn't do it at 14, but he knew he had to escape. And he did it when he was 25 four years old. He took my mom uh, when she was 18. So they were very young. And you can imagine, right? Young kids leaving a country which nobody wanted them to leave. And he would, they were telling me about the bread lines. And I'm getting goosebumps and chills because I can relate when you talk to me about it, but I can't relate because I've always had a supermarket. I've always had a refrigerator. I've always had a TV. I never understood the difficulties of my parents having an outhouse with no plumbing to go to the bathroom in the cold winter of Russia, right? So when you're living through all this time, tell me about that upbringing. How did you handle yourself in school? What did you study? What did you want to be? Did you have dreams back then? Because was the dream just to get sour cream on Saturday or was there a bigger dream when you were a kid? Sometimes people ask me, did I envision all of this? And I'm like, are you crazy? I lived behind Iron Curtain and I didn't speak a word of foreign language. You cannot possibly imagine because it's impossible. For 70 years, nobody left the country. It's, you, you don't get a passport. There is no flight. There is no way to imagine it. And you cannot have that vision. But I had a lot of um, joy and luck and real grace of God in the way that I was uh, brought up. On one hand, I think my parents, because on both their side, they lost at least one relative during the executions. And Kazakhstan was, like Ukraine, an object of a government-designed artificial famine. So in our case, 40% of the population of Kazakhs were murdered in the famine between 1929 and 1933. That was my great-grandfather. That's how 
um, they experienced it. With that, your parents raise you to be ready the next time 40% of your people could go. They raise you ready for next time that there is nothing. So we would, we grow our food because nobody knows if there will be food in the store. We um, figure out how to fix all of our clothes. My daughter is 18 and she knows how to fix her clothes. Normal American kid, but she knows how to, you know, run basic things and earn her money with anything, cleaning, fixing, uh, cooking. She can do basics because I know it helped me and I know it was helping generations before to have some of those super grounded skills and be ready if that is happening. And at the same time, I had a lot of beauty in my life. So I was uh, in a professional dance troupe and it was the discipline with the, because all of Soviet dancing is based on a classic ballet, even though we danced on stage folk dances, but the classic ballet gives you the discipline that is very close to the stoic philosophy or the meditation philosophies, you have to put in the repetitive hours and get the discipline. So it helps you all your life. Um, I had amazing friends when I was already older. Um, I had a chance to try a new job very early. The Soviet Union collapsed. I was still a teenager. Got my first job at the insurance agency. I was uh, 13. 13 and a half. So there are things that would never happen now, but because there was a crisis and everything broke and we had no country anymore and no government and no police and no ministers and nothing <laughs> and no currency. Kazakhstan had no currency for a couple of years. We had no capacity to even develop our own currency because we didn't have enough experts in this, in this, in the country, in the land. So you, when the life cuts open and kind of cracks open. The beauty of my upbringing is that I was ready to grab it. And I think for many people, because they were very much in a resistance mindset, they literally saw it as something killing their life. And it, it was a very big spike in suicides because people felt like there's no reason to live anymore. And that's, I think, what's going on right now. People are living through tremendous turbulence wherever they live, inflation potential recession. We just are coming out of COVID. What's going on with monkeypox? I mean, wherever you're listening, you have your own, whenever you're listening to this podcast, you have your own stuff going on. But whatever that is, there are two options. You can be going through it, kicking and screaming, or you can use it as an opportunity. And I had a chance, a luck to be in that bringing where this was like, we will survive, we will be there. So when my husband and I were naming the company, we named it, we exist to remember our grandparents who didn't survive, to tell them we made it, we made it. That was in the 90s? 1991. 1991, perfect. Do you have any siblings? Yes, I have older sister and younger brother. And they are where? They're all, everyone in my family lives in Kazakhstan and they're happy. Still. Many times offered to do whatever they want. We live in Europe, we live in US now, but they're happy. And where do you live now? Columbus, Ohio, US. Columbus, so you're in US, okay. And so did you meet your husband? Um, you're, I'm assuming you're still with your husband? Oh, yes. Okay, so did you meet your husband in the in Kazakhstan or no. in the US? I met my husband in Cleveland at a Halloween party. We were both grad students. I was starting my PhD program and he was finishing his MBA. And I was a little bit young for a scientific pursuit. Most of my uh, colleagues were 40 plus. The closest friend I had, uh, Denise from Turkey, was 53 and I was 22. So I would sneak to the MBA parties because they were closer to my age. And we bumped um, our backs into each other. He's from Belarus. From Belarus. My CTO is from Belarus. Uh, one of the programmers uh, is also from Belarus. So I'm very familiar. So tell us about your early days of your professional career. Did you go through school first all the way to your PhD or did you really start working before that PhD? I started working when I was, as I said, about 13 and a half, I want to say. And I started working, funny enough, is because my parents were very afraid that I'll get pregnant. I don't know mm -hmm. where they got this idea, but um, the country collapsed. The crime was very, very high. And there was nothing else for the kids to do anymore. 
we used to have sports and clubs and dancing and whatever else and everything disappeared overnight and they were very very worried so they found a company for me to enter to work in the insurance business and imagine a soviet union for 70 years no private property nobody owns anything there's no such thing as insurance and then i had to sell life of all possible <laughs> ways of insure people life insurance in the huge inflation and every collapse so i had no clue what i was doing and i was very bad salesperson but they realized very early that i can tell stories so they moved me to marketing and pr and from there i would go to a lot of conferences and events to speak about making a context for life insurance and i met a youth organization called the association of young leaders that still exists that gave me the first training and the first job as a trainer in leadership and strategy and surprisingly for youth organization i learned the same tools and same theories i later learned in the phd so i was a youth organization in my high school came to us for the first time in 95 again in 96 still in my high school and then entered the university in kazakhstan and transferred on scholarship third year into us wow and what did you do what, what was your dissertation on well, organizational behavior is the field, and it's a kind of intersection of people, strategy, and systems thinking. That's the closest I can say. But my specialty is large system survival. So I, I study, surprise, <laughs> <laughs> I live through collapse of the system. So I study why some systems collapse and why some systems survive and how can we make sure the right ones survive. Got it. So, you know, I've never heard of a CRO, a chief reinvention officer before. What was the origin of that title? Did you find out about there or did you create it uh, during your, PA your PhD? And more importantly, I think, what drew you in to becoming a world expert in chaos management and reinvention? Mm -hmm. It was a pretty long journey. And I think that's the lesson I'm learning about all of life is emergent strategy. There's kind of two schools of thought on strategy. One is the traditional Michael Porter, which is deliberate strategy. You know, you set the goal, you set the action plan, you march, no matter what, you stick to it. And that worked very well in a very stable environment in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. Beginning the end of 90s and this century, the second school of thought, that would be Henry Mintzberg, the emergent strategy, let things emerge test things out, experiment, get your hands dirty, fail a few times, and then it emerges. It's definitely a story of chief reinvention officer. So I had an academic career. I'm a recovering academic. Uh, it's like a <laughs> recovering alcoholic, you know, quite yes. recovery. You kind of relapse and do research and write books. But I had a formal position as a chaired professor in a business school. And one of my executive M M MBA students, so he was a, a CEO of a company, he said, you speak nicely. I almost believe you. The problem <laughs> is I don't know if you ever worked in a massive company. Like maybe you had tiny jobs in the 90s, but come on, you just book smart. So he was my first client. It was a consulting company that we started with my husband. We exist, reinvention agency in 2007. So we just turned 15. And what we did is we helped companies figure out why things are not working and how to move to the next cycle of growth. And if things are already breaking apart, how to survive and find a way forward. Generally speaking, most of our companies at the beginning of our clients would come because things were already not working. But of course. after a while, it became much more popular to do preventative measures and reinvent ahead of the disruption and really grab the opportunity and kind of get all the beautiful, juicy stuff before the market realizes that the opportunity is here. So I was doing that. It was not at that point called a reinvention agency. It was called a consulting business. And they called us consultants for unsolved problems. Like they couldn't. And in 2014, seven years into business. So we started in 2007, 2007 no website, no business card. And now you will laugh, guys, in terms of branding, I, every time I tell the story, I feel like horrific. So we're sitting in the lawyer's office and they say, now you need to choose the name. Everything is ready. We signed, but we need to put the name in. And we're like, we don't have a name. We don't have a name. 
And they said, you need a name today. Otherwise, we'll book you for another appointment. You'll pay new money. And we're like, <gasps> and my <laughs> husband's last name starts with J and my last name starts with Z. So, and we live in Europe at that point. And we call our company Jay-Z Consulting. And then a year later, somebody says, Jay-Z like the rap star. And I'm like, how could you be so stupid? Like, this is inappropriate beyond belief. You cannot put that name. So we renamed it later on. So no business card, no website, horrific name, but we were passed from CEO to CEO, owner to owner uh, because of word of mouth. And I still had a career in, as an academic and my husband still had a, before that executive career and in Europe he had his own business career. So it was a sidekick, it was a side hassle. And I do think having multiple careers, being a slash person, as we were discussing before we started, yes. not just an academic, but, you know, I'm a professor slash business owner slash yoga teacher slash mom slash whoever. This is a way to think about it instead of cornering yourself into choosing. At some point, one of my careers was the primary and the other ones were auxiliary. Now it's the other way around. So 2014, we ran out of capacity. We couldn't accept clients anymore. And because we were doing such a weird work, we couldn't mm -hmm. even grow the team very much. We had a pretty good team, but we couldn't grow. So our client said, could you teach us? And I'm like, teach you what? Like, they say, you're doing something repeatedly. What is that? And I'm like, I don't have a name for it, let alone give you toolkits and uh, frameworks and steps. And I hired a wonderful professional, Mark Levy. He was the one who, for example, helped Simon Sinek to get his idea. Oh, wow. That with why. Mark was torturing me in his coaching sessions. Another thing, get yourself support. Cannot afford it, get your friend to think with you and be the accountability partner with you. If you have a luxury to hire a coach, great. You cannot hire a coach, get the best of your you know, colleague, friend, whoever, and have a structured, regular check-ins to really, really challenge each other. So he really tortured me. And one day he's like, okay, I'm so done with you. If you were like your job, your consulting efforts, if it was a title in a company, what would it be? And I was like, it cannot be chief strategy officer because we also do execution. It cannot be chief innovation officer because sometimes you need innovation and sometimes you just need to slightly adjust what is happening and keep maintaining the current business model. It cannot be transformation because that's really, you know, kumbaya and there's not enough numbers there. And I kept pushing and pushing and finally I said, I think it would be chief reinvention officer. And he stood silent there on Zoom and he's like typing something and then he said, I think you need to buy the URL today. And that, that's how the title was born. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, I'm very lucky. I have a coach inherent in my co-founder. We coach each other, but the best of the best have coaches. Uh, if anything, they have multiple coaches because they know that no matter how talented you are, you only see things from within. You're not seeing anything from the outside. And somebody to point out a thing or two might spark up some interesting concepts in your life. So let's talk about change because we're getting there, right? The chief reinvention officer, the name reinvention is change because you're reinventing yourself. So I know your experiences in business, but businesses don't run themselves. People run the businesses, right? And the problem with people that I personally noticed throughout my life is that 99% of the people I ever knew never changed. They are the same today as they were a decade or more ago. While a few individuals, probably people like you and I, are consistently reinventing themselves. So first, do you agree with that notion that there's a 99 and 1% ratio in the population? And if so, what chances do we have in the business world other than a few companies who have those 1% of the individuals who embrace change? You look at Steve Jobs, uh, Elon Musk, those are the people at the helm. But if 99% of the businesses are managed or run by those who never want to change, where do we go? 
Well, uh, good news on the number side, I actually have statistics. There's a wonderful um, studies on the law of diffusion of innovation. It's a way to understand how do you spread a new idea, any new idea. For example, getting everyone to be a vegetarian. I always use this because, you know, I'm from Kazakhstan. We eat horses. We are far away from, we're in the magic culture. We don't have vegetables. There's no vegetables in the desert or steppe. You eat meat. So I'm like, if we want to make the entire Kazakhstan <laughs> vegetarian, and which is impossible, what would it be? So two and a half percent on the average, on average in a typical population, two and a half percent are innovators. People like you and I who are crazy with ideas and constantly generate something new and new titles, new products, new books, new whatever. Then there's about 13 and a half percent that is called early adopters. And the interesting thing about them is that they don't buy our products because they love us. They love our products sometimes, they hate sometimes, but they buy our product because they think of themselves as a person who tries first. They're the ones who sleep in the tent when the new iPhone drops, and they're the first one to buy the crappiest flat screen TV at 15,000 because they are the kind of person who have the first TV in their block. So yes. this is not about our product or us, it's about them. And it's them who the early majority, which is the next 34%, go to to say, hey, how's that TV? So should I, or was it worth it or what? The early majority never hear or like innovators. They hate Steve Jobs of the world or Elon Musk or whoever. They go to their neighbors, early adopters and like, can I push some buttons and let me smell how, how, what's going on here? So generally speaking, we know the general population, but we have a problem. We've been educating people out of their reinvention capacity. It's not that we are not capable to reinvent. Maybe not truly innovate, but reinvent, most of us are capable. And how do we know we look at kids? The baby doesn't need a bonus to start walking, really. And they, there's no baby in a normal health. I apologize to anyone who is unfortunately dealt bad cards and had a birth problem and a sickness in the early childhood. I'm not talking about that situation, but any other baby with a normal development pattern, which is 90 plus percent of babies, they don't, you know, fail a hundred times at walking. And by the way, a typical baby fails thousands of times at walking. And it's yes. not like they failed a hundred times and they sit there and like, you know what, walking yeah. is just not for me. Yeah. I'm not going to walk anymore. That's yeah, it. It's just not my thing. I'm, you know, I'm not born to, right? So we are reinvented at birth and we are reinventors at birth. This is our normal thing. We don't need special skill. We don't need motivation. We don't need training. We just educated out of it because society generally had a much more stable world for a good couple of hundreds of years where we lived in an industrial age. And the sign of an industrial age is that everyone is a piece of a machine and you need to play your part and do your thing. And God forbid, you will reinvent yourself because then the machine doesn't have the piece it needs. So very early on in the childhood, we are teaching kids everything that stops their reinvention capacity. Why do we shut them up on day one of school? Why are they not supposed to talk? Your brain cannot process information without physically speaking it or writing because we're not linear in our brain. Our brain processes different pieces of information at different times. So if I say, I am in Columbus today, every word in that sentence is processed simultaneously in a different part of a brain. Unless I say it or write it down, I do not comprehend it. I don't learn. So why do we shut them up the day they come to class? You cannot shut up a typical five-year-old, but we force them. Why do we make them sit down? We make them sit for 40 minutes so they prepare for eight-hour shift, 40-year career and retirement. That would be my take on your question. It's not that we're bad at change or we're resistant to change. It's that we are heavily educated out of our native capacity. And if the normal law of diffusion of innovation works, a typical system reinvents on a regular basis. We just haven't had a need for it in the 20th century, and we haven't fully awakened to the 21st century and to the fact that almost every business assumption we used is no longer serving us. You know, I, I was thinking of a book uh, by the name of Crossing the Chasm. 
Of course, excellent book. That's exactly the book. Anyone who wants to know about the law of diffusion innovation and how do you flip the system, great book, read it. Yes. And for every entrepreneur out there who invents anything, you are looking for those crazy people who are going to buy your product, knowing that you're going to make mistakes, that they're not going to have a perfectly well-rounded product. So I, I get what you're saying, but I'm going to push a little bit harder. Yep. So in your opinion, and going back to the change, the mm -hmm. theory of change mm -hmm. that is forced upon us by society to keep us in chains in a career through the time where we retire with a gold watch. It's different now, but in the past, that's kind of where they were forcing the individuals uh, in school and then out of school. But in your opinion, you said change is healthy, yes. right? And embraced for those who want to succeed in life. You say that change is an opening to imagine new versions of yourself or your company, a new and better way, right? A way for us to rethink and reimagine what's possible. But so many of us are scared of change, mm -hmm. okay? It can't be just the fact that we were brought up in, in a state that we had to com mm -hmm. comply. There has to be something else that as humans puts God's fear on us anytime there's chaos or change what else could it be? There are a couple of things. So I'll give you, this will be lecture mode on. Forgive me, guys. I'll try to make <laughs> it as entertaining as possible. But there's at least three things that come to my mind immediately. Number one that comes to my mind is the fact that there is a biological association. So there's a biological response. And it comes from what you learn in your biology courses on fight or flight syndrome. Anytime we hear any sound that sounds scary, if anytime we get any kind of disruption, we have this temporarily turned on response where your adrenal glands are pumping adrenaline into your bloodstream so that you are ready to kill the beast or run away from the beast. And it comes from thousands and thousands of years of evolutional learning where really the main disruption on our life was a physical threat. Either it's an animal here to eat me or the enemy from another tribe. There's not uh -huh. much diversity. in. So our brain right now doesn't separate. Is it a tiger trying to kill me or is it my boss being cranky? Yeah. To the brain, because it's a part of the brain in the stem area that does not process time, it's always in the moment, and that sound sounds scary. Boom, mm. your adrenaline is up. So yep. your heart begins to pump. You're sitting in a meeting, and you're like, blood pressure is going up. Your heart is pumping. You're like, what the heck is going on? What is going on is your body redistributing blood from your brain because for survival and killing the beast, you don't need blood. It's moving the blood out of your brain, out of your gut, into your muscles, so you can, you know, fight or run away. Yeah. But even more importantly, your eyes stop seeing full picture. Literally, we stop recording peripheral information. Your hearing stops hearing things. It's called auditory exclusion. You literally do not record a, mess, a sound not connected to survival. So you sit in a meeting, your blood has left the brain, so you cannot think. You have auditory exclusion, you cannot think. Your eyes are like this, you're out. Now, this is bad news, good news. For a typical person, it takes about 90 seconds to clear it from your system. From the moment it hits the bloodstream to the moment the kidneys start cleaning, 90 seconds. That's the how long you don't have control. The problem is that most of us don't know how to stop the new cycle from starting. Because mm. our brain, if we keep thinking about it, we can be stuck in those 90 seconds for nine years being angry about something that happened in the last economic crisis yes. or when my neighbor was this that and blah 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 so as entrepreneurs we have to learn how to give ourselves our 90 seconds my daughter when she's very angry coming from bad teenage drama she comes in and i give her all kind of solutions and she's like mama give me my 90 seconds so you need to give yourself 90 seconds to fully feel it because it's already in your system you cannot really stop it but then you need to be very clear how to exit because you can get stuck there for a very long time and you literally don't have enough blood in your brain. Literally, it's not a metaphorical thing. There's not enough supply there to come up with creative solutions, to adapt, to find opportunities, to build connections and so on. 
So of course, there are many other things that are going on. Why are we so bad at it? One, we don't learn self-management until we really, really invest in that. It's not something we're taught in school. And we don't understand our basic bodily functions enough to know how to really utilize this beautiful tool that we get. Yeah, you're, you, you're spot on. In my experience, it's, it's fear, right? It's fear of failure. It's fear of death. Uh, change, in essence, is death. Yes. No matter how you look at it, something is dying for something new to arise. And I think subconsciously, we don't like death in any format. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's one Wayne Dyer, the late Wayne Dyer, stated, when you get bit by a snake, the snake bite never kills you. Mm -hmm. It's the venom that keeps on going through your blood over and over and over again that ultimately takes your life. And that's the monkey brain. Yes. So the event itself, you know, not having cheese on your cheeseburger, yeah. your wife says something, your friend says something, any external force, and you speak about external forces, mm -hmm. we pay so much attention on external forces that we forget that it all is internal mm -hmm. and we project out the internal to create the external that we ultimately die physically, mentally, emotionally with that venom running through our blood. So Beautiful metaphor. Oh, thank you. So I want to I want to change subjects a little bit. As I stated earlier, you're a fascinating individual and very accomplished. You have multiple TEDx talks. Very impressive. Not one, but I think three or four. Four. In four. You have four. I'm aiming for five and be done. You're aiming for five. You you got a one very ambitious person. So the one that really struck a nerve for me because I've listened to three or four of them, I think, or all of them, I definitely three. But the one that really struck a nerve was the one titled How to Kill Your Own Company. Mm -hmm. Okay. And in that talk, you tell the story of the mighty Titanic and the lessons that we've learned from its sinking. Now, I'm not going to go into the story because I really would like to urge the seven hatters to look it up and listen. Okay. It's, it's, I promise you guys, it's that good. But what I want to speak to are the three points that you discussed that really caught my attention. And I want to address them for the seven headers. So I'm going to go point by point and ask you a little bit about each one. So point number one, on the Titanic, the mightiest ship at that time, the best of the best, there was a crew and they were out that evening and they were manning the, the crow's nest. And for those who don't know what a crow's nest was, like I didn't, uh, it's a structure uh, in the upper part of the main mast of a ship that is used as a lookout point. So the crew, you know, at that point had a bell. They had a phone, right? The latest technology to warn the captain if anything should arise, they were out there. But they didn't have their binoculars because those were locked up in the cabin. And I'm not going to tell you how. You're going to have to listen to the talk. And you claim that. By having binoculars, if they just got their binoculars, it would have given them a much greater chance of survival as they would have seen into the distance where potentially they would have spotted the oncoming iceberg. And the analogy is that we as entrepreneurs or business leaders, we don't carry our binoculars with yeah. us. And we ultimately fail to spot the iceberg ahead, whatever it is. And we actually have proof of that in reality because all businesses, including those who are leaders in their industry, go through this at one point or another. But I want to point out a few in my lifetime that mm -hmm. I still can't imagine went through it. So if you look at Blockbuster and Netflix, if you look at Nokia or BlackBerry, who had absolute market share, and Apple came along. You look at Kodak, who invented the first digital camera, mm -hmm. and now Canon and Nikon have it all. You have Toys R Us, and no longer because Amazon came. And there's so many others, right? So what is your point of view and what can we learn from those disastrous downfalls? Mm -hmm. Number one thing, treat anticipating change as a golden, golden task that you allocate consistent time to. Consistency, that's the most important thing. Um, I was doing a training for our students in Reinvention Academy just an hour ago and somebody asked me, how do we make sure we don't have any blind spots. I said, in today's complexity and chaotic world, you cannot. The, the number of signals 
is too great to separate signal from the noise. You cannot. What you need to make sure, it's not that you don't have blind spots, that you don't have blind holes. <laughs> and those are easier to spot. And we just need a consistent time to speak to people we don't normally speak to, to look at the trends we refuse or pretend not to notice, to make sense, what does it all mean, to get together with other entrepreneurial friends and say, what are you seeing in your industry? What are you seeing in your industries? Are the sales up or down? What's the general saying on the street? Are the employees quitting? Are they gaining? What's the average? Like, this is work. This is not a side story conversation. Unless we start anticipating change like we mean it, it will not work. And by the way, guys, you don't need much money for this. I use Facebook to test tons, tons of trends. I ask one question with an A or B answer or one word answer about once a day. My audience on both LinkedIn and Facebook, I ask them inside our private group, are you choosing A or B? Is your sales up or down? I need to get a feed from the community because I don't have the money to pay expensive consultants for very fancy reports. Yeah. So that doesn't need to be expensive, but it needs to be thoughtful. And number one, get your binoculars, your binoculars, get them in your hands, clean them up and start using them. Do you think that there was a chance for Blockbuster or BlackBerry to beat out their competitors at that time? Is it, was there anything that they could have done? Do you think? hundred percent, but it's a mindset. As the Titanic story is a mindset story. When you think you're unsinkable, you already sunk. Hmm. When you think you are thinkable, you already sunk. And wow. that's a mindset problem. So you think that you're untouchable, unsinkable, and you know, you got it, you're done, you cook. So as an entrepreneur, and I love that quote, as an entrepreneur, if you're getting into an industry that's already well-defined mm -hmm. and has large players, there might be a chance for you because these large players might already feel like they're invincible like nothing could touch them, right? 100%. Right before COVID, a wonderful, very, very high quality research institution, Inosight, predicted that by 2027, 50% of all Standard & Poor companies, 50% will be off the list. That was <sighs> seven years into, right before COVID didn't even happen. We are seeing a turnover of the mighty and unthinkable like we've never seen before. This is our time to grab the niches, to offer alternatives. People are not as loyal as before to a singular brand and the brands cannot hold their spaces. But our mindset needs to change. Also, one is unsinkable mindset. Another one is I'm too small. Who am I to play? Blah, 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 blah. Who am I to play? I barely speak English. You can hear my accent. Who am I to play? I was born in the Soviet Union. I'm a brown girl from a God forbidden Kazakhstan. But I come with a lineage of people who died for me to be here. Why do yeah. I use my crazy name? Because my grandfather died over that name. So your parents and your grandparents and your grandparents did the same. You came here because you are something. And that's also a mindset on the entrepreneurship side that has to change. That thinking of making yourself small. I was talking to a young entrepreneur recently. He was visiting our home. He he was a, a son of a friend and he said he needs to get some kick in the butt. Can you host him for a little bit? For a couple of days, he was staying with us. And he keeps walking like that, like this, like this. And I'm like, why are you making yourself small? Start taking up space. Just start taking up space. Perceive yourself differently. Allow yourself to take up space. Don't apologize for being in our house. Take up space. And I think that's also entrepreneurship mindset that has to be developed. And that comes also with just testing the waters and uh, having good people around you. Absolutely. And I love that. I think that you, you nailed it. Those that are too big have a mindset of failure. And those that are too small have a mindset of failure. You know, it, and it also, it's not just about having uh, the authority. Sometimes young brands or young entrepreneurs raise a bunch of money. 10 million, 15 million, 50 million, whatever it is. Yeah. And they fail hugely mm -hmm. versus those that are bootstrapping it. Mm -hmm. Because I think, again, mindset of, oh, I'm good. Yeah. I have money. I can spend it on marketing. I can spend it on product. I can hire a bunch of people. 
but in essence, they stop innovating mm -hmm. because they feel like the, the, the capital that they have will compensate for their ability to struggle mm -hmm. and hustle like an entrepreneur. You know, there's no such thing as an overnight success. We're approaching kind of an overnight success for seven years into the business. I think three to four more years yeah. will be just right for that overnight yeah. success. Absolutely. And that's, that's on us. We have to learn to figure out who we are. And there's nothing more of a commodity than money and ideas. We keep yeah. thinking, that's why I'm saying the 20th century thinking. The 20th century thinking is like money is short. There's very few players who have it. We cannot have access to money. Money is a democratized commodity right now. There's more money on the planet that possibly we have value for. You can crowdsource, you can crowdfund. There's tons of ways to get money. And ideas, Google it. The problem is not money or money or ideas. The problem is the execution that stems from the right mindset. So that's on us. It's funny. Tony Robbins did a TED talk. Yeah. And he was, and Al Gore was there. I love this story. And he looks at Al Gore and Al Gore tells the story of how he failed to win the election because, and he started naming every reason that he failed. And Tony Robbins looks at him and he says, no, you had plenty of resources. Mm -hmm. What you didn't have is resourcefulness. Yes. And I was like, whoa, mic drop right there. Yeah. All right, <laughs> let's get to point number two. Yes. Okay. So thank you for the binocular story. I think we, we covered that fairly well. So the crew at the Titanic had some of the latest technology at that time. They had an incredible radio system that would probably allow them to get warnings from other ships, I think, they you know, in the area, right? They and, and in fact, other ships, I believe you stated in your, in your, in your talk that they were radio, radioing the SOS. They were giving them the warning. But the crew actually didn't want to listen. They were preoccupied with servicing their first class guests. You know, they took customer service to the extreme, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, they were thinking about their customers and neglected to listen to the outside warnings. Mm -hmm. What can we learn about that point in your story? Because in my company, customer service is incredible, right? That's you have to take care of your, your clients. But I'm learning as we even speak and listening to your talk, where does customer service go wrong? Mm -hmm. How far can you take it where it actually becomes destructive? Mm -hmm. I think it is uh, shifting the eye from the customer service as a prescribed steps uh, or satisfaction in the moment to understanding what value am I creating? So the Titanic's main value is delivering you to the destination, hopefully in one piece of life. They misunderstood that this is the most important value. My job is to bring you to New York and make sure you are alive in New York. And it stems from the unsinkable because they thought they could not fail. So then nobody even remembered what's the actual ticket that they sold. They didn't sell first class seats for the uh, chairs and the china and the beds and all of that. It was number one that you will arrive alive. And that's the value I'm selling. And everything else comes second to that. They misplaced it. And I actually, when my team was researching the story, I actually read the physical messages that were transmitted and the actual recorded answer from the guy who died, the radio operator. And the passing ship was trying to warn them that there's a lot of ice in the water. And his answer was something like, shut up. That's a quote. The shut up is definitely a quote. Um, get off my frequency. I'm working the first class passengers messages. And you read the messages and they're like, Arriving tomorrow, order flowers for lunch. They were not life-changing. They were not like, this is really important. They were just a flimsy, capricious act of, I'm bored, what can I do? Maybe I should send some messages. But misunderstanding that as a value proposition to 
you arrive safely as a value proposition is very, very difficult. And I think a simple hack you can do is put on a big post-it or stick it on the wall next to you. What is the value you're delivering? And is this customer, how do I respond to that customer from the perspective of that value? So if the customer is very upset about something, but your main value is, I know, security of your IT system. You say, we understand your concern. However, we have to prioritize security of your data for this and this reason. And because of that, we will get back to you in, I don't know, whatever. But you have to always come back to underlining, emphasizing to yourself, your team and your clients that value that is the primary value. And Titanic completely lost sight of the value there. You know, I had an aha moment right now. And I think what we were speaking earlier about the seven hats Mm -hmm. on how I learned that by focusing on one hat, Mm -hmm. solely focusing, it actually is destructive to that hat. If you focus on the business only and don't focus on anything else, your business will fail. If you focus on your body only and nothing else, your body will fail. So it's the same with customer service. Mm -hmm. And so we as customer service freaks say that the customer is always right or listen to the individual customer. But if you don't understand your overall priority as a business, if you don't understand the value that you're delivering as a whole for everyone, and you're focusing on individual clients, that can easily kill your business because the resources are going to individual clients that don't affect the rest of the population. And eventually you run out of resources to be able to take care of that organization. And even in my organization right now, we're going through something as such where we're building a new product, Mm -hmm. but my chief operating officer is working and focusing on standardization Mm -hmm. for the group, for the whole. And I'm focusing on, well, this customer said this, and we have to focus on this customer. And it's that back and forth fight between, no, I really want to help a customer. And he said, this customer is going to kill your process and standardization and everyone's going to suffer. So thank you for that, because I had my aha moment that it's not about the individual customer only. Yes, you should listen. And potentially that complaint could be applied as a whole, but you cannot look at one individual when you're broadcasting. And that's, and that's a big thing. So thank you for that. All right. So, and finally, point number three, the captain of the ship was asleep. Mm -hmm. And the first in command was the gent was a gentleman who was literally a world expert in avoiding maritime disasters. Yeah. He was the preeminent avoider that failed to to save the ship. Mm -hmm. Why did he fail when he was so experienced in navigating these exact scenarios in the past? And what can we learn from that mistake Mm -hmm. in our current times? Well, you have to know that the captain was asleep on, uh, for a good reason, they worked in shifts. So Mm -hmm. it's not like he was drunk. Thank you for that. Yeah. So the first officer is manning the ship at night as he should. He was an amazing man by all accounts. He died. Uh, He was um, seen saving people up until the last moment. First officer Murdoch, he was in his late 30s. And he was in the news uh, before for preventing collisions in the most impossible circumstances. The problem what killed him is his own success, his own best practice. There's a number of engineers that now say that if he stopped, he didn't do nothing. So if he literally did not touch the wheel and didn't tell, didn't give any commands, the ship would hit the iceberg straight on. It would be damaged, but because the compartments would not be cut, it would not um, really go down. Taking the water. Yeah. So this is a very big issue for me, right? I I had a luck of having an academic career. I'm an expert. There are some names attached to me, books attached to me, awards attached to me. So I come into a meeting and um, some of my youngsters say, how about we try this? And I'm like, we've tried this 200 times and this and this and this here. And they sit there and they're like, that smells like Titanic syndrome. Right? <laughs> and they don't, they, you know, they pull my leg. They're not afraid to be honest with me and thanks God for that. But it's our human nature, right? If something worked for us in the past and we did very, very well, it's natural that we turn it into a pattern and we, this is the best practice, let's use it. But in today's fast moving world, constant volatility, constant disruption, 
uh, high turbulence. What worked five years ago can exactly be the thing that kills you today. And let alone what worked for me may not work for me. Really cannot just take off the shelf a solution from another company and say it will work for me. The context is different. The team is different. The supply chain is different. Like everything is different. So it cannot be an automatic a kind of knee-jerk reaction anymore. We must, we have to start being more mindful. Does it mean that all of our past successes and best practices are out of the window? Absolutely not. But it means we cannot be in automated step. We cannot automatically jump. And we do so many things automatically. Some of the research shows about 95% of all of our bodily activities every day is completely automatic. So it's natural to us, but here we really have to build a culture in our team. If you're a solopreneur, then have an accountability partner, somebody like my team who doesn't give a damn. They will tell me straight, <laughs> you are losing yes. shit. Take your crown out, you know, put your crown down. Come on, lady. And because they're young, like they have no reference to anything I've done. They're like, whatever you did in the 90s, who cares? Or 2000s, it's long gone. So you need somebody like that who will say, hey, hold on a second. Maybe it will work, but let's not assume automatically it will. Yeah, that's why I love hiring younger individuals to the team that are fresh without a lot of experience because not that experience is, is not a good thing. It is a good thing. You want experience when you're hiring. So I'm not telling people to hire people with no experience. But when you're hiring with experience, you're, if you're hiring somebody from the outside, they start asking questions. I mean, I know for myself, I've been through two really big in my businesses as an entrepreneur, two big events, 2008 and then COVID. Mm -hmm. In 2008, as a first-time entrepreneur, fear took over. Mm -hmm. Anything that I was trying to do, I was completely in fear, fear mode, and I was making horrible decisions, as anyone does if they're making decisions based out of fear. When COVID happened, I took on that experience, at least the understanding mm -hmm. that I cannot operate on fear. And just that piece, but I allowed the rest of it to manifest. And again, it wasn't me. It was my team. It was my co-founder. We all navigated it together in a new way. And I think that's what allowed us to survive, you know, COVID. So it's, it's interesting. Again, these are such an incredible conversation. So I, I actually have one more point that I want to mention from your talk. Uh, I don't know if you know who Jim Rohn is. No. Uh, he was uh, Tony Robbins' mentor. Mm. Uh, one of the most incredible speakers of our generation. Highly recommend you look him up an incredible, incredible person. He told a story one time of his mentor because he was like this kid who didn't have a, a path or an idea of what he's going to do. He was lost and he found a mentor who really helped him become a world-class individual. So he tells a story of his mentor who asked him to write down when he first met him, a list of every reason that he thought he wasn't successful. So Jim went home, you know, wrote down a list after like two days of thinking about it and brought it to his mentor and his mentor looks at the list and he shakes his head and he says, Jim, that's a great list, except there's one big problem. Your name ain't on it. <laughs> yes. And that became a famous quote of Jim's that went like this. I used to blame everything outside of me for my lack of progress until I found out that my problem was inside. Mm -hmm. So Nadia, it's tempting to blame the iceberg, isn't it? Very much. It's so tempting. Every time I'm in a meeting, it's like the competitors or the freaking supply chain or the regulator, the taxation, the, the uh, millennials, the old timers, the boomers, the, the list is just it's so tempting to blame the iceberg. And the thing is, we live in a world we're not just going to expect icebergs. Imagine that iceberg, tsunamis, earthquake, fires, and everything is coming your way because it is. Yes. And the question is not, will you change or not? You will change. Yes. The question is, will it be on your term with your active participation and conscious choices or will you be dragged kicking and screaming by somebody else's choices? Somebody oh, else that. choosing for you. That's it. That to choose 
There's no choice here to change or not to change. There's no question. You will change. It's only the question, will you be part of that game or you will be a pawn in somebody else's game? Oh, that's so good. You know, when you said that, it reminded me of my co-founder. Uh, one of our, our services to help brands, uh, manufacturing brands, achieve success in making decisions when they promote and raise awareness in, in retail. So mm-hmm. if they're doing a price reduction or sale or demos or whatever they're doing to promote their product, they obviously need to understand how effective those promotions are. And they need to make choices every single day. And my co-founder always says, they're going to make a choice and decisions on their promotions with or without us. Mm-hmm. It's not like they're not going to make a choice mm-hmm. or make decisions. Yes. But it's up to them to decide, are they going to make decisions blindly or are they going to make decisions with data? And I think just that just came back. So does that relate to what you coin as Titanic syndrome? Yeah. So Titanic syndrome is a corporate and individual disease where we bring about our own collapse due to our own arrogance, our excessive attachment to past success, or simple inability to spot and adapt to new changes. Yeah. That's- and it's a, com- it's a syndrome because it shows up. In- what is a syndrome? A syndrome is something that shows up in many forms. So it's a form of a disease that is not just, you know, my liver hurts. For some people, it's eyes. For some people, it's liver. For some people, it's feet. Same with Titanic syndrome. On Titanic, there were hundreds of examples. The, the shocking thing is that the three stories I tell in the TED Talk, the edX Talk, there's a very very short list. The actual list is huge. And you're like, how can it be that much wrong? How? Because the root cause is the same. It just shows up in 200 different manifestations. But the root cause is arrogance, attachment to past success, inability to spot and adapt to change. Wow. That's- you know, we speak of arrogance. You mentioned arrogance. So when, when I hear arrogance, I hear ego. Yeah, fear. Okay. Fear. Mm-hmm. And my spiritual teacher, who I had on my podcast, probably one of the first two or three episodes, he stated that the antidote to the ego is humility. Mm-hmm. Is the antidote to arrogance humility? I truly believe that fear and arrogance is the same. Arrogance is a fear covered up. You don't need to be arrogant if you're truly confident, if you don't have fear. You don't have a need to make yourself an artificial something. You don't need to boast. You don't need to push others down. You don't need to fill up the space with blah, blah. None Mm -hmm. of that behavior is necessary. So it's a compensatory behavior to deeply rooted fear that we refuse to admit to ourselves and we find a way to cover it up. And every time I see um, an arrogant person, um, for me, the question, what uh, what are they so afraid of? And how can I how can I bridge around that so that we get over it? Because it's not helpful. It's just not helpful to them. It's not helpful to me, to, to the world. So uh, in that sense, um, I think it's a lot of fear. Uh, when you are at peace with who you are, you don't need to be loud. That is amazing. And like I said, the topic of fear, especially with entrepreneurs and the decisions that they make, is so prevalent. It needs, it requires more attention and more people need to speak about it because self-doubt, imposter syndrome, not making decisions on time because they don't feel like they can make the right decision. It just goes on and on and on and it's all based on fear. So you mentioned in one of your talks that reinvention is always a step back Mm -hmm. because you're reinventing yourself and therefore it's almost as if you're kind of like a brand new startup all over again. We felt the same. We had a business prior to COVID that was well-established and we were doing really well. And then COVID hit and we're like, holy shit, we had to reinvent ourselves Mm -hmm. and which we did. And we took so many steps backwards. I can't even tell you because we literally started a new startup. So what can we do as founders to keep the momentum going on Mm -hmm. our current products? right? Or offerings while adopting to the uncertainty and chaos of the new reinvented opportunity, because now we have an established business, but we still need to take resources away from that to go backwards. How do we handle that chaos and change? 
there are a couple, couple of things to remember. Number one is to remember that the main question is when. It's not how, it's not what we do and so on, who, but when. Because research is very clear. If you start reinventing on the decline, so you already started seeing the decline of your current business model in terms of cash flow or whatever else you used to measure, the chances of you coming back to historic performance is only 10%. That's a beautiful wow. book called Stall Points. Why do we stall? And it's an excellent research. You don't want to buy a book, Google it, um, Harvard Business Review article, Stall Points, and you will get the gist of it. But the essence is, if you reinvent on a decline, you're cooked. Hmm. That means you need to start reinventing before you hit the peak. And for most entrepreneurs, like, why fix what's not broken? What is stupid here? You must get into the pattern of fixing things right before they get broken. Because at that point, you are still cash flow wise, you are making the surplus so you can invest. In terms of the emotional state of the company, there's no panic. Political will, the will to make tough choices. When yep. you are already panicking and nobody wants to be responsible for another crappy decision, it's too late for that. But there is a will at this time. So number one is when. Number two, it is physically impossible to do simultaneously running of its existing business and building a new. Meaning in one day, 99.99999% probability, if you're trying to do the current operating thing, all those fires will always win and you will be firefighting and you will say, we'll get to it tomorrow or we will postpone it until tomorrow. Or we'll, it cannot, it's, it's a different form of thinking. It's slow thinking versus quick thinking. It's a different skill set. It's a different attention span. You physically cannot have the same topic in one meeting. Interesting. You yep. need to find a way to allocate secure time. And there are some companies who do it differently. So some allocate a separate team and that's their only thing. Some allocate one day a week. And nobody can, unless, I don't know, the fire and earthquake, literally, unless like death, nobody can take that day for anything but the new growth. And everything that day is the new growth. And usually it's Friday because it's right before weekend and you need that slow thinking and not stress and not, you know, what's my next day deadline and stuff like that. So sometimes it's allocating a separate team. Sometimes it's allocating a separate time, but physically it's your our brain, our nervous system cannot do it on the same day, in the same time, and so on. And we do not physically multitask. If you ever think you're multitasking, your brain- <laughs> You're not, you're switching. No, you're switching and you're losing so much productivity. So you cannot stop pretending you can't, uh, stop telling yourself you will get to it. You will not, not because you're stupid, not because you're lazy. You're normal, you're healthy, your brain is functioning how it's supposed to. You cannot, you should not, and you should work with your brain rather than pretending that you can have a will over it. So remember when, allocate separate time and do very, very, very quick iterations, very quick iterations. So we speak about cascade of quick wins in the early range because your team is losing confidence. They're like, why in the heck are we doing this where we could be updating, improving whatever the current business model? Why are we wasting our time here on something that clearly will not bear fruit? So early on, they need some fruit. They need anything that looks like a quick win. So as you're planning out your experiments early on, cascade of quick wins, tiny, tiny short sprints experiments, and then you can really go into full on program. You know, it took me, I think, three years now to almost admit that I'm not a good multitasker. So I'm just telling you, it I might take that. another year or two, but it's, I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Uh, you know, it's funny. I can literally validate that theory, mm. okay, in real world terms. Mm -hmm. I'd like to take credit for being this genius that maybe has learned from you in the past and took that experience of making the changes on the way up before mm -hmm. the decline. Mm -hmm. But I can't do that. It came with luck, but I can tell you that it does work. So here's how it happened. In 2018, mm -hmm. one of our clients said, Hey, what you're doing with your current product is fantastic, mm -hmm. but I need you to help with this product. Mm -hmm. It's a complimentary product, but it's a different product. And we said, yeah, that makes sense. And we decided to build a new team mm. to take on this project in 2018. Mm. 
And it took us a year and a half to build the prototype of yeah. this product. It wasn't a great product. It was a prototype, an MVP. And it was literally completed to go as a prototype in January of 2020. 2020. Yeah, that's why I'm smiling. I have no doubt that it was right on time for the COVID. 2020. We hired somebody in 2020 who helped us take it from MVP to a polished product. Took about two years now. And now we have a suite of products. Mm -hmm. And because we allocated a separate team to it, separate allocation, it wasn't panic. We were still able to generate a little bit of revenue from the original product to to support the, the new product. But to the T of what you're saying is exactly what happened to us. And I guarantee you, if we decided to take on this new project, when COVID hit, you and I would not be speaking today as me being part of this corporation. It would not happen. So I'd like chills. Every Everything you're saying is like absolutely on spot point. So, Thank you. so when an event like a COVID affects the collective consciousness of the world, do you think that we should reinvent or pivot because of this rare event? Mm. Because just because an event forces change, does that mean that you should change? Or should you hold steady and wait it out? Because mm -hmm. that's a typical question because yeah. if COVID comes in and I'm like, I'm owning a restaurant, oh, let me create a, a, a farm or something completely different. While when we could have waited a year or two and if we could have survived it, the restaurant would come back to, to life. So what would you recommend? So we have researched nine different types of reinvention ranging from tiny, tiny incremental improvement to a massive radical disruptive innovation. And there is nine of them in different scopes and different ranges and intensities. So you need to choose your plate carefully and create a custom-made solution for you. Which, is, you know, which pieces do you want in your portfolio? And there's no one answer. The answer that I usually give goes to the heart of what reinvention is. Reinvention is a new field. It's a field that connects and aligns strategy with foresight, with design thinking, with innovation, with scrum agile, with change management, because all of these tiny isolated fields used to kill each other, fight each other, whatever. And they have to work together on this new reality of turbulent world. So we are platform failed, but we are working on only one thing. We are only studying one thing, and there's only one criteria. We're about sustaining and increasing the level of life in the system sustaining and increasing the level of life in a system. So if you are a thoughtful business owner and you looked at your restaurant and you understand what will at least sustain the level of life, and if we are in a free fall, at least slow down the fall of the life in a system, however you measure it, uh, financial performance, employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction, your own life world, value, your seven hatters, guys, you know this is holistic view. So however you measure it, the life in a system, your job is to sustain, protect, and possibly increase. In the middle of crisis, we're really in sustaining and protecting. In normal life, we're all about increasing. So if what gives you life and brings up a little bit of life in the system is keeping the restaurant, getting the PPP, giving everyone a chance to stay on vacation, and I know, chill, and watch videos on how to cook new dishes. Great. That's reinvention. If what gives you the highest level of energy, focus, new cash flow potential, blah, 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 do that. But it's not left or right. It's, is it increasing the level of life in the system or is it decreasing? And there's no other criteria. Wow. You know, there's a guy named Bashar. For those who are not spiritual, will think he's a kook. For those who are spiritual, might resonate, but look him up. I will. He states that the secret to success as a human being is to always follow your highest excitement. Mm. That's it. Yeah. Whatever that is. If it's sitting on the couch watching TV, fine. If it's going out and creating rockets to go to Mars, no problem. Whatever your highest excitement is will lead you to your soul's capacity to create the experiences that are here in this world for you. Anyway, take it or leave it. I don't know if it's true, 
but it is what it is and reminded me. So your incredible success in your career is unlike most people because where you came from and what the outlook was for you as a child to where you are right now, I'm not even going to give a percentage. It is zero, basically. Okay. With surrounding error. What was the one habit that helped you achieve this success? I spend a lot of time alone. If, if that is the one thing, yeah, that I come back to, however I feel it with meditation, yoga, walking, exercise, reading, writing, whatever. That has been a constant in my life. That would be very, very important. I do try new things, but I think it's a product of that one habit rather than the actual habit is because I am connected to who I am and because who I am is not my hat, using your metaphor, I love my hats, but I'm not my hat. Mm, Any hat I lose, so I'm not a professor anymore. Who cares? I'm not, my mom, my daughter just went to college, so I'm not actively mumming right now. Yeah. You know, I have my mama bear moments, but generally speaking on a daily basis, my level of being a mom is decreased by 99%. But I am not less or more if that is a different role in me. I'm not an entrepreneur if I cannot do entrepreneurship, writing, speaking, none of that. When you have a chance to really know what's unshakable in you, what is unchangeable in you, then it's very easy to change and reinvent and be then fearless in trying things out because no matter what I can lose in the process, what matters I can never lose. And that comes from spending enough time with myself on a daily basis. Hat number one, the soul. Yeah. Self-reflection. Yeah. I love that. All right. I can speak with you for days. It's but such, such I, a pleasure. I always like to close out my interviews with the following question. Mm -hmm. Who did you have to stop being? And who did you need to become to manifest your current success? Mm. Had to stop being convenient. Ooh. I grew up being very convenient. I'm easy, smiley. I'm, uh, I'm very flexible in approaches and I can try new things and accommodate like nobody. And to become a, a beast, and I can still be very smiley, but to stop being convenient and be okay with being very inconvenient served me very well. I love that. Tell the seven hatters what you're currently up to and how they can connect with you. Well, it's an honor to be here and I'm excited to get to know the community. And there are many ways to connect, but the easiest one is to drop by our website, learn to reinvent.com. The two is a letter. So learn them, letter two to learn to reinvent.com and grab one of our resources. We have a book download. We have business model cards. We actually cut them out and play with them. So you can download and play with business model cards and see what business model fits you next in terms of reinvention. But I would love to hear from you and I would love to see you use the tools and telling us how they're serving you, how we can improve them. One of my favorite episodes, and I am about to launch my 50th episode. Oh. And I can tell you, Nadia, that you've not only affected me, but I'm sure many others, and they're going to come out and reach out to you. You mentioned that your last name is sacred and you never changed it. I actually changed my last name. My original last name was Sverdlik, the Russian name, and I changed it to Selik. I took a few mm -hmm. consonants out because marketers were not able to call me and say anything. They were, excuse me, may I speak to? And then they would just hang up. So I was like, if they're having a problem, I might as well change it. But you kept yours as a keepsake to your family tradition and what they've went through. So let's give it honor. Pronounce your name the way you would pronounce the name, not anyone else. So the seven hatters can hear it. Thank you so much. So my first name is Nadia. And my last name is Jaksimbaeva. Thank you so much. A pleasure. Thank you for being a part of the seven hats. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Nadia. 
Let's end today with a show segment that I refer to as, What Can We Hang Our Hat On? And Here's My Takeaway. You see, I started my entrepreneurial career in 2005. And I can tell you with certainty that chaos, change, uncertainty, and reinvention are the name of the game. I've experienced two life-changing black swan events, the 2008 financial crisis with my first company, Luvala, and COVID in 2020 with my current company, Promomesh. The struggle for entrepreneurs is real, and without a solid game plan, we too can face the concept Nadia coined the Titanic Syndrome and ultimately kill our own company. Nadia tells the story of the Titanic when she took the TEDx stage to provide us entrepreneurs insight into the lessons that we can learn to avoid sinking our ships. The first lesson is to ensure that we never forget our binoculars. We must always look out to the distance in order to avoid fast approaching disasters. The problem is that we as entrepreneurs, we're so busy putting out fires at the moment that we tend to neglect the opportunities or disasters about to arise. So make sure to keep your binoculars handy and not lose sight of the future in the present chaos. The second lesson that gave me my aha moment was to focus on the most important value of the organization first and above all, other focal points. The most important value promised to the Titanic guests was not to deliver great service or to ensure that staff delivered their meals on time, but to bring the passengers to New York safely. And because they lost that vision, they missed the opportunity to take the appropriate and timely actions to save the ship. The third lesson will be a tough one for most experienced entrepreneurs who feel like their previous success will guide them as new challenges arise. As Nadia states, in today's fast-moving world, with constant volatility, disruption, and hyper-turbulence, what worked five years ago can be the same thing that kills you today. So be mindful and don't have that knee-jerk reaction to solve today as you solved yesterday. And finally, I want to touch upon the blame game. You see, in 2010, when I had the opportunity to blame everyone, including God, for my loss leading to my rock-bottom moment, I chose to ask myself the following question. What about me caused all of this in my life? And by going inward and taking responsibility, I am confident that my life changed for the better. Nadia claims it's easy to blame the iceberg, but that mindset will get you nowhere but some. I want to thank Nadia once again for joining me so that we can all benefit from her wisdom. And until next time, If you found this episode helpful, please hit that subscribe button and tell other entrepreneurs out there what value you receive from it so that we can attract even more high quality people into our Seven Hats community. So for now, I will bid you farewell and success on your journey. And until next time, my name is Yuval Selleck and I tip my hat to you.